May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The lesson that we're studying this morning is the gospel lesson written for us in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, which was read just a few moments ago. I will not repeat it here, but I am going to reread, reread it during my, my message. Dear disciples of Jesus, do you know who you are, really? Are you content with who you are? Are you comfortable in your own skin in any circumstance? How you answer those questions will tell you in what or in whom you have anchored your identity. So, in what or in whom have you anchored your identity? Now, I recognize that in the comforts of church, we probably all realize the answer the pastor wants us to give. Why, we, I am the dearly loved, heaven-sought, blood-bought child of God. I am everything Christ is except for his divinity. True enough. Good for you if, if you believe that, and not just believe it, but if you've been able to, to work that conviction out in your behavior and in the way you conduct your life. Then these words of Jesus will simply support what you've already uh, come to believe and practice. They already confirm that your world has been turned upside down. My experience, however, has taught me that while I am really good at confessing the truth, while I can, I can say what I believe, I'm not always really good at living what I believe. Uh, at times, my behavior betrays my confession and conviction of faith. See if that's true for you. I, I know my value is rooted in the, the very dear price that God paid to redeem me and make me his child, that of the, the life and the blood of the Son of God. I truly believe that I do. But I also find in my heart and my mind when I'm out hobnobbing with the members of the community that I, I like to, to seek out those more influential members of our community, maybe greet them, shake hands, talk a little bit, maybe even sit down and have a meal with them. And if I don't get the opportunity to do that, I notice sometimes my mood begins to sink. Now, now why is that? My, my value is not dependent on, on whom I know or sit with. My, my importance is not determined by what others feel or how they treat me. And, and frankly, good and honest people are more likely to, to uh, like me for who I am rather than because of whom I know or sit with. Have you noticed a, a similar principle at work in your life as well? Why is that? What gives? Well, what gives is our sinful natures. That, that old sinner that we drag around with us since our, our conversions doesn't think much of God's approval. It craves the approval of other people. Other important famous, more powerful people. It, it, it purrs at the praise and accolades that other people pour on it. And, and although maybe not intended, but true to its nature, that old sinner in us is leading us to shame and to be disgraced. And when that happens, then the devil jumps in and he tempts us to despair and to unbelief. And that is what Jesus, who truly does love and care for you, wants to spare you. So, on one occasion, when Jesus was invited to a banquet at the, at the home of a, a prominent Pharisee leader, uh, he accepted the invitation to go on the Sabbath to, to this banquet. St. Luke tells us in the intervening verses that when he got there, he... he was confronted with a man who was sick from some kind of inflammation. We're not sure what that was. And Jesus, already knowing he had some issues with the Pharisees, asked them, 
is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And, well, what were they going to say? They were having this big banquet on the Sabbath too. They said nothing, and so Jesus healed the man. And then we're told that Jesus kept walking, probably went to his table. Uh, we don't know which table that was. It might have been the head table. might have been another one of the tables there. But I, I get the impression uh, from what St. Luke tells us here that Jesus spent most of his time simply observing what was happening in the room. And then when he spoke, I, I, I believe the only people who heard what he was saying were those who were seated with him at his table, wherever that may have been. And of course, we know that when the, the host made his way around, Jesus also had some words for him. Now, we're blessed by inspiration to be guests at Jesus' table this morning. And, and since the sinner in each one of us is a Pharisee at heart, these words of Jesus are also for us. St. Luke tells us, One Sabbath, Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee. He was being very carefully watched. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a, a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished with, with, than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I don't know what your reaction is to those words of Jesus, but my initial reaction was, was one of questioning. Why would Jesus say this? It, it, it seems to me that Jesus would certainly not have opened his mouth to offer a public service announcement that I think falls under the canopy of common sense and good manners. Was Jesus really just concerned with their manners and the way they behaved? That he would tell them that th this advice that I, th I think if you looked hard enough, you could probably find in any secular source as well. I mean, don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Be humble. Uh, don't assume positions or places of honor. Because if you do that, you could be humiliated in front of everybody when you're asked to step down. And uh, Rather, it's better to assume low places and then be asked to come up to more honorable places, that, that just seems like common sense, doesn't it? I, I don't believe, however, that Jesus was just offering tips on social conduct or, or manners. You know, the Savior didn't, isn't Mr. Manners. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm sure Jesus had excellent manners, but that wasn't his purpose in coming. So what was Jesus driving at? What, what's the point Jesus was trying to make? See, I believe with this little uh, offering of advice about how to behave at a wedding banquet, Jesus was pricking the consciences of those who were seated around the table with him. Gently so, nevertheless, he was pricking their consciences. Now, as you think about that, I, I, I'm going to read the next comments that Jesus offered to the host of this banquet. Then Jesus said this to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous." Now, given what we've already deduced about Jesus' first words, it also now doesn't seem likely that Jesus was simply helping his host to be a bit more genuine in his love and generosity, does it? I, I'm just as convinced that in this case, Jesus was also gently pricking the conscience of his host. I'm certain of this because Jesus always taught spiritual lessons 
and he, all, and he frequently used some very common events in life to make his spiritual points. And I believe that's what he did here too. So we have to remember that Jesus is in a house or a room full of Pharisees. Remember who the Pharisees are. The Pharisees in their day were the conservative, Old Testament, Bible-believing people. They were the ones who took their, the Scripture seriously. And, and early on, they had recognized something special about Jesus. Uh, they, they knew from his teaching and from his miracles that he had to be sent from heaven. Nicodemus admits that to us. And, and there were perhaps even a few of them who were beginning to wonder if quite possibly Jesus might be the Messiah. And if he were the Messiah, well then certainly he would have been delighted to share their company. He would have sought them out and, and, and perhaps even patted them on the back for being so devout in, in their practice of, of the Old Testament scriptures. However, Jesus kept pricking them poking at them, and this is no exception. And there were a few, and as we learn from the Gospels, it began to grow, who began to question if they would really like Jesus that much. And although his, his approval of them would be a feather in, his, in their caps, his disapproval would certainly cause some embarrassment. Jesus was using their behavior at banquets to expose a deeper spiritual sickness. Their behavior at banquets was simply a symptom of their unbelief. You see, these Pharisees believed that they had earned God's favor and approval with their good works and righteous behavior. And what Jesus was pointing out to them is that they didn't have any good works or righteous behavior, none that would so much as raise the divine eyebrow. Instead, their behavior was indication that they didn't have those good works, that they didn't have that righteousness. And, and Jesus wanted to point that out to them so that they would humble themselves before God and, and receive his mercy. However, as the Gospels all indicate, many, if not most, of the Pharisees took offense at Jesus. They refused to acknowledge the truth about themselves. And so they made Jesus their enemy. Already, St. Luke told us that they were watching Jesus very carefully. Now, I pray that you will not so quickly dismiss these words of Jesus to you. But rather, that you will take your behavior and examine it. That, that you will examine how often your behaviors, your thoughts, and your attitudes quite possibly betray a deep spiritual sickness or unbelief in your heart. If, if we need or crave the approval of others, why is that? If we need to, to gather the rich, the famous, and the powerful around us to feel special or loved or important, why is that? If we need the presence or the praise and accolades of others to feel special, to feel loved, accepted, to maybe feel that our work is important, that, that it has value, why is that? And, and then, where does such slavery end. The reason that we would look to others for approval, for acceptance, that we would find in others a cause for our worth or value is because we don't trust God's declarations of us or his promises to us. And whenever we forsake his declarations and promises, we embark on a most sick and deadly search for approval, accolades, worth, and value that we will never find, achieve, or possess. We will die eternally 
and suffer forever in such vain pursuits. This is in large part why so many people in our world today feel hopeless. See, they have come to recognize that by themselves, that is truly what they are, hopeless. Friend, only Jesus holds the key to hope. Only Jesus gives real, solid hope, because only Jesus is hope. That's what Jesus wanted this banquet full of Pharisees to see and to acknowledge. It is what he also wants you to believe and to, to acknowledge. So what are God's declarations of us? What are his promises to us? Well, I think you know them. God's first declaration of us is that each one of us is 100% sinful, selfish, and sunk. God's declaration is that we are his blind, dead enemies. He has also declared, though, that we cannot fix ourselves or our sinful situation, our condition, ever, in any way, to any degree. Our sinful behaviors, our, our hidden motives, our pharisaical attitudes, and the way that we use others are proof that God is right on with his declaration of us. And for that, we deserve another declaration of God. We deserve God's declaration of condemnation. That is, guilty, worthy of death and eternal punishment. God, however, did not pronounce that declaration on us. He had not announced it to the Pharisees in our lesson. God's response to our 100% sinful, selfish, and sunk condition was to send us his son. Not to condemn us, but to save us through him. God sent Jesus to do, to accomplish, and to complete for us all the good works and the acts of righteousness that we could never, ever do on our own, not even with help. And then God sent His Son also to take on our wickedness, our sinfulness, in our thoughts, words, and in our actions. And He poured out the condemnation we deserved on His Son. And He made His Son pay that death with His death. And with his suffering. God offered his son to be the one single sacrifice whose blood and death truly have washed away all sins. Yours and mine and everyone else's. Then, by raising Jesus from the dead, God also was making a declaration to us that the world now is justified through faith in Christ. So God's declaration of you who are in Christ is this. Redeemed. Restored. Forgiven. Righteous. Holy. But perhaps the best of all of them is this. My dear child. When you trust God's declarations of you and the promises that he has made to you, and when you not only trust but then live and think in your mind, always conscious of those declarations, you will find that you become a very balanced, content individual. Never, ever think less of yourself than what God by His grace has declared you to be in Christ Jesus. You are the child of God. You are a brother, a sister of the Lord Jesus Himself. You are heavenly royalty. But you see, trusting that then frees you 
to think of yourself less. To put the needs of others ahead of your own. To, to talk to others and ask, about them, ask them about themselves rather than having to talk about yourself. To heap praise and, and, and honor on others rather than seek it for yourself. You, you, you treat the, the have-nots just the same way you would treat the haves because they're all special, redeemed children of God. Then as you carry out that conviction, that faith in God's declarations and promises to you, you are going to be God's messenger of hope to the hopeless in your community. Let's pray about that. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for reminding us again of who we are by nature, that we are those sinful Pharisees in our hearts. And so we, we humbly throw ourselves at your feet and plead for your mercy and your forgiveness for those things. But we also pray that you will strengthen our faith because you've also drawn a, our eyes to you. You who is our perfect substitute, our righteousness, our payment for sin, and yes, God's declaration that we are in fact his children. Lord Jesus, give us firm faith in that conviction, in the, in the declarations and promises of God, so that though we will never think less of ourselves in whom you've made us to be, we are now free to think of ourselves less. Help us to consciously put the needs of others ahead of ourselves, to, to talk about others rather than ourselves, to heap praise and accolades on others rather than to seek them for ourselves, so that in this small way we might begin to give witness to you and become dispensers of your hope to a hopeless world. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have a blessed week.